Hey, what's going on YouTube? It's Pyromancer here and welcome back to my channel. Hope you're all having a wonderful day, morning, afternoon, evening, whatever time it is, wherever you are in the world. And I appreciate you guys coming to this video. Remember, if you enjoy this video, hit the like button at the end and hit the subscribe button for more content like this in the future. I wanna to talk to you guys today about the Jailer and a little bit more about the Shadowlands and this whole Maw thing. But before we do that, I just wanted to kind of give a shout out here to a uh, very talented artist in the World of Warcraft scene in the Warcraft community. Uh, someone who I've actually witnessed the kind of uh, growth and uh, evolution uh, of their art over quite some time now, and someone that you guys actually, you may or may not know. Uh, and that individual is uh, Fabelina. And here I have a book that I actually purchased uh, from Fabelina. Uh, from lulu.com. I have a link to this down in the description below. And this is the first volume of the art of Fabelina. And I'm obviously not going to go th through all of this because this, that's like the kind of the whole point of you buying it. But just to kind of show you like some of the detail and like beauty of what's going on here, I just kind of thought that uh, you guys might want to check this out. If you guys like to support artists in the Warcraft community, if, if you want to help someone further their aspirations, you know, and their goals and, and accomplishing their dreams, uh, I just thought uh, you guys might want to check this out. I looked through all of this this morning, and there are some absolutely gorgeous pieces of art in here. Um, and I think that some of you guys would really enjoy that. So if you think you might, there's a link to that in the description down below. All right, so let's just quickly define what the Jailer is, what he does, and uh, the purpose of the Maw and, and what the Maw is doing. So uh, it's been hard to get a little bit of clarification on this, but apparently since right around the time period just before the fourth war uh towards the uh the middle and the ending events of legion something happened with the machine of death that caused all of the souls that would normally die and go to the arbiter for judgment uh to automatically be fed into the maw and this is apparently what what is said you know this is the the breaking of the the machine of death uh, now, people are immediately asking, okay, what is it that happened that broke the machine of death? Uh, good, good question. Uh, it could have something to do with the lantern that, uh, that Sylvanas got from Helia. It could be the fact that, uh, I don't know, we uh, decided to fight back against the Burning Legion on their home homeworld, uh, fight uh, the Titan of Death, uh, and, and uh, basically stop uh, Sargeras and... and the use of Argus's power to uh, reset creation through through death and rebirth. It could be that, uh, or I could be completely wrong. Uh, it could be that us fighting and defeating Argus actually helped to repair the machine of death. It's really hard to say for sure, but it's something that's happened relatively recently. But the big problem with the, the breaking of this machine, so to speak, is that the souls are going straight to the Maw. And the Maw, as described at BlizzCon, is apparently this inescapable prison where once, you, once you're once you in it, you can't get out of it. And Ian mentioned in the, the you know, what's next, that it's a one-way trip. Once you're in the Maw, that's it. It's basically like the, uh, the kind of perfect prison, which is a little bit alarming because this is a, a sort of a way that I view the Void as like this perfect all-consuming prison and it doesn't matter if it's physical matter or souls or what have you once it's in there it's not coming out and there's no way that you can ever escape it but the thing about that is, is that the mall was specifically previously reserved for only the most vile and irredeemable cruel and twisted souls out there so part of the big issue that I take with that is that it came down to the Arbiter's judgment as to who would go there. So you essentially come before this Arbiter that according to some accounts, and I cannot stress this enough, the specifics of the quote say, according to some accounts, the Arbiter predates memory and predates the Titans. Now, would I say that the Arbiter predates all Titans? No, personally, I do not believe so. Part of the reason that I, I don't believe that is because if you listen to the 1,000 Years of War canon audio drama, it says that Argus predates the existence of the universe. Now, what exactly that means in specific terms is up for debate. Is the universe the physical reality in which we exist? Is the, uh, is the universe everything like more like the multiverse of like you know all different realms and and like the shadowlands and the in the dream and all that does he predate all of that it's it's hard to define that for sure it also does say in chronicle which 
I know at this point in Chronicle, it's it's kind of something we're going to have to try to discern and, and kind of learn from. But it says in Chronicle that the Shadowlands came to be when mortal life first arose in the cosmos, which I find really, really interesting. Because if the Arbiter predates memory, if what Chronicle says is true, and that the Shadowlands came to be when mortals began to exist, which I guess I, I could see kind of makes sense because mortal beings are what die and go to the Shadowlands, right? Like you can't really have a realm of death without mortal things that can die and go there, right? Like what's the purpose of, of a realm of death when there's no mortality? So if what Chronicle is saying is that it, it came up when mortals came up, but then we're being told that the Arbiter predates memory, the question becomes, in World of Warcraft, is memory more than just what we perceive it as, right? Like when we think of memory for ourselves, you know, it's as far back as it's things you can remember. Like that's the entire concept of a memory. However, in some fantasy universes, memories go a little bit further beyond that. And memory can actually leak into this idea of magic and, and memory-based magic. I believe there's even a, uh, a Loa. Is it a Akunda? What's it called? That there's like a there's like a fucking dinosaur Loa thing that's in Voldoon that can actually use what appears to be lightning to wipe the memory from somebody. So as far as uh, what what memory really means and, and when memory became a thing, uh, if we're to take that in a very literal manner, I would have to ask, what is memory? When, when does it actually, like, how do you define the origins of memory? If what Chronicle says is true, that it came when mortal life arose in the cosmos, could the Arbiter have existed before the Shadowlands did? Because it seems like the express purpose of the Arbiter is to decide where people go. Now, this is kind of a, a big point of contention for me. Like, I don't really know what to trust. And think about this as well. The Shadowlands, when you look at the cosmology map for WoW, which they put a lot of emphasis on in this last expansion, Shadow is like Void, Old Gods, Void Lords, but it's not Death. But the realm of death is called the fucking Shadow Lands. So I find that to be a little bit strange. That shadow has nothing to do with death, apparently. But the literal realm of death is called the Shadow Lands. So that, I thought that was a bit weird. Uh, but I don't, I don't know what to trust. Because I've speculated a, a long time ago, when I was first starting to say that Argus was the, the death titan or titan of death or whatever, what have you. That Argus probably is the one that crafted the Shadow Lands. Or perhaps from the light, which I believe is Azeroth, the light of creation, the Shadowlands was born, and thus Argus likely was born along with that. If that's the case, I mean, I'm not opposed to the idea that, that Azeroth predates all the other Titans. I think she probably is the first one. Nazoth does actually have a quote where he says, she is not the last, but the first. Drown her and you will see. I think that's probably talking about Azeroth not being the final Titan, but the first Titan. Um, and, and as I believe that she is the light of creation, I, I think Shadow could come from her. But it just kind of, for me, it brings into question, like, when did the other Titans actually arise? Because in Chronicle, it says, according to legend, the first one was Amon Thul. Is that when memory started? Is the existence of time when memory begins? Because without a progression of time, you cannot remember back to a specific instance of time for something. Like, these are the kinds of questions. This is the kind of stuff that I think about. So... To, to move past that, um, I'll just finish that particular part by saying I'm, I'm having a hard time discerning and deciding what to believe as far as the origin point and existence of the Shadowlands. Uh, so let's move on from that. About the Arbiter, this is like a, a kind of a troublesome thing for me because the Maw, right, this inescapable prison that once you're in there, you're irrede you know, you're an irredeemable soul, you can never get out. And it's a it's supposed to be apparently the Arbiter's choice uh, as to where you go. And how that works is apparently the, the Arbiter is this, this very wise, all truth seeing being where when you come before the Arbiter, the Arbiter can see into the truth of your soul and, and see all of the things that you've gone through, and it can see um, basically the, the, the truth of your very being, and it can decide where you're supposed to go. But here's the thing, is that this has to be based on a sense of morality. And what I mean by that is the Arbiter has to have some type of guideline as to decide what truly justifies something like being sent to the Maw. So I ask myself, what kind of horrific atrocities must one actually have to commit and for what reason would they have to commit them in order to be damned to something like the Maw? Right, like what do you have to do 
Do you have to be a Garrosh who through his, his you know, growing up and, and what the Warsong clan really was, and, you know, the actions of his father and their interactions with the Burning Legion, you know, Garrosh was was a, a hell of an aggressive and sometimes, you know, prideful war chief. But at the same time, Gar that's, that's how Garrosh was raised. That's how Garrosh's lifetime kind of presented this development for him. And in the end, sure, he might have gone a little bit crazy with the whole old god thing. But for me, you kind of have to ask, like, if the Arbiter can see into the truth of one's being, is the Arbiter empathetic to those types of things, right? Like, Arthas committed terrible atrocities, but most of the reasons for which Arth Arthas did such things is because Arthas was being heavily manipulated by dreadlords like Malganus and by the Burning Legion, right? So is Arthas supposed to, you know, fall into this category? Nerzul is another one, another person who was who was just menacingly uh, manipulated by Kil'jaeden to do these these terrible things. You know, it, it it really makes me wonder what you have to do. One of the biggest individuals who I think of, of course, is is Sylvanas. Sylvanas has done some some pretty terrible things, uh, some pretty awful things, and and I would I would like to think that if there's any soul that's current in the WoW game and WoW universe that would more than likely go to the Maw in death, I'm thinking it's probably Sylvanas. But then that other side of me who knows Sylvanas' story and knows who she was before she fell to Arthas and knows these type you know these things has to ask you know is is that even fair? Sylvanas may have been a little vain and a little prideful as Ranger General of Silvermoon, but she died trying to defend her people. She, she died in such a way that was just so horrific, and for Arthas to basically fucking sunder her soul from her mortal body and twist her into this horrific banshee that she is now, part of me has to try to be empathetic to that. And part of me has to try to relate and, and understand how that must feel, you know? I can't even imagine that Sylvanas as a being is is necessarily even capable of feeling hope at this point, right? And and how can you really how can you really at a soul truth level judge someone to such an extent when you know the horrific and and just terrible unspeakable things that they had to go through being that having their mind twisted to the will of the Lich King and basically, you know, being forced into this being that that is potentially not even able to feel regular emotion. You know, I'm sure she feels the cold. I'm sure she feels pain and anguish. And I'm sure that she feels rage. Oh, I'm sure of that. Uh, but I feel like the question becomes, is she even capable of feeling these other things like, like love, right? Like, I feel like she must at least have some kind of capacity for love for her sisters and hope and, and, and those kinds of things. So... My biggest question about the Arbiter and the, the thing that I'm just really unsettled about is we're basically having to put our faith into the judgment and morality of this being. In this being which we have zero fundamental understanding of the, the moral guideline of its thinking and of its judgment. And I just, I, I, get the, I get what they're going for here. I get the idea that it's this truth witnessing thing. But I just, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm really not sure about it. Uh, regardless of that, the Arbiter's not receiving this, uh, these souls and the ability to do this at the moment. Everything's going to the Maw. And the way that it was worded with some of the interviews and statements from BlizzCon, it sounds like all these souls being fed into the Maw, and this could be what Sylvanas is referring to when she says countless souls have been fed to the hungering darkness, it, it may not be Nazoth she's talking about. It's probably ab about the Maw. And remember, Sylvanas talks about how in the in the Before the Storm novel, she could use Azerite to deal death on a scale that, and then it kind of cuts off and stops her thought. And Ian says that at BlizzCon, what if Sylvanas was really just trying to cause as much death as possible? Because in the Fourth War, like th events like the burning of Teldrassil, these events are sending souls to the Maw, but it seems like this is powering up the Jailer. Now let's talk about the Jailer. I will say first and foremost that I think the Jailer is probably the source of necromantic power as far as what we've witnessed on Azeroth, and it's probably the source of the power of things like Frostmourne, the Helm of Domination, and things like what we know as the Scourge. Obviously the Necrolords are going to be immensely important 
in regards to that, and probably even uh, what we learn about the Nath regime and what we learn probably through Revendreth. Uh, but I think that the jailer is, is basically... <laughs> the the official real jailer of the damned and that the lich king is more of like a, a little like a small version of what the jailer is right you have this big ass tower jailer of the damned uh you know bolvar and arthas or whatever and there's a prior to that where it's literally a tower that stretches up into the sky and atop of it is this you know the lich king with his little fucking helmet uh, so it, c it could be possible that the jailer himself is basically like the og lich like basically the king of lich uh, liches and potentially the king of necromancy. Uh, I, I definitely am not so sure that the jailer is death himself or anything. I think that that falls to another individual. You guys are well aware of who I think that is. Um, but the jailer himself, I think, is an, is interesting. And based on the visual appearance of it, the helmet is is very similar to the uh, the helm of dom uh, domination. Now, another thing about the jailer is what is his job? His job is to keep the most vile and terrible and irredeemable souls jailed right? That probably would have been someone like Sylvanas previously, but because she's working with him, she's probably going to escape that fate. So even though Sylvanas has done terrible, terrible things, it could actually end up working for her and our favor in the long run. But here's the thing, we're told the Jailer's supposed to be the big bad guy, but I don't really believe that, unless the Jailer is being corrupted or controlled by something else. The reason why I say that is because how can the guy who's supposed to be responsible for the jailing and potentially torture of the most evil and vile and terrible souls in the cosmos, how is he? How is he a bad guy? Like, how is that a bad role? That's like, in that's like the that's like a warden. Like, that seems like a good thing that, to do, right? Like, it doesn't make any fucking sense to me. And I think Blizzard's kind of been lining up this idea that Sylvanas is doing horrible, terrible things, but she has like a game plan that kind of stretches further beyond what we can understand. And I would kind of think that if there's any point during which Sylvanas kind of is turned around to be the good guy, which whether you fucking like it or not, I think is probably going to end up being the case, kind of like the necessary evil of the, you know, the, the necessary evil, like you got to do the bad shit to get the good shit done. Because um, that's a really powerful theme in WoW, like Illidan and like Sargeras, uh, then I think that that's kind of inevitable, but it doesn't make any sense to me that the jailer is somehow some bad guy because he jails the evil souls. Like, the fuck? Sounds like a good guy thing. To look a little bit further into this, the jailer seems currently to be the jailed. Like, something has happened, and, and this machine of death breaking could have something to do with, with what's happened potentially to the jailer. Uh, it seems that the jailer has become the jailed, and so, and, and the reason I say that is because in the cinematic, when you see him, there's chains coming off of his body. We've definitely never seen anything like that happen before, especially not by by the hands of the Titans. Uh, so it seems like Sylvanas is working not for him but with him. More than likely, they're both serving an even greater entity uh, in order to fix the machine of death. Obviously, Sylvanas in her quotes saying shit like, "In the end, death claims us all." Uh, you know, she's trying to master the power of death. Some would assert that it seems that Sylvanas is trying to become death. I mean, you could you could go that route. I haven't seen anything that kind of is deliberately leaning me towards that particular standpoint on it. But yeah, it would seem that they're both probably serving an even higher entity. And I believe that that's probably Argus. Let's, uh, let's kind of take a side point on that as well. Who else could be working with the Jailer and with Sylvanas? Well, the first one that comes to mind is obviously Helia. Right, and uh, Steve um, Denniser, I hope I say that name right, uh, said at uh, BlizzCon that we're going to learn more in the Shadowlands about what that deal with Helia and Sylvanas actually was. It's interesting because what he says is, it might not be what a lot of people think that it was. When you ask most people what was Sylvanas trying to do, I think that most people would likely say that Sylvanas was trying to use the, the Lantern to gain control of Aegir to make infinite Valkyr or to basically make the Forsaken people immortal. But what's, what Steve is kind of hinting at is that's not what's actually happening. It's, ser it's likely serving another purpose. Now, Taliesin made a really, really great point on Twitter uh, about, a, about a week ago, I think. And he said something along the lines of, it most likely would not have been uh, someone in league with Odin that Odin traded his eye for. If you guys don't know this, Odin basically took his eye and traded it to a being in the Shadowlands uh, in order to peer into the Shadowlands and see what was going on over there. Um, 
here's the thing is that whatever's in the Shadowlands, specifically things like the Jailer, is probably not a very big fan of Odin. And as Taliesin points out on Twitter, it's because of what Odin was doing. Odin was basically taking the strongest of all the fallen of Rykul souls and all those powerful warrior souls and stealing them and making them his own. And some of them were being turned into his own kind of light Valkyr. Now, I don't think that the Shadowlands would probably be very big fans of that because it's basically titanic uh, intervention where this being that descends from the Titans is, is basically filtering through taking the strongest souls. That's not very, that's not a good thing because it's it's basically like if you were to, um, it's like if you were raising animals, right? And you were basically breeding something, we'll say f dogs or something, and the most healthy and, and strong dogs or whatever, you basically were always removing from the gene pool and just leaving the weakest and like kind of runts of the litter and kind of starting to breed them. You're basically filtering out some of the best of the genes and sending the shit into your, your continued reproduction. It's kind of the same way with the Shadowlands where like you're taking the strongest souls and you're you're keeping them for yourself because that's a great fucking idea, Odin. And then you're sending the other ones, uh, the weak ones, into, into the Shadowlands where the Shadowlands is kind of hearkening back to this idea of rebirth, right? Like this is kind of the one of the biggest underlying themes of the Shadowlands. So whatever's in the Shadowlands, specifically the Jailer, is probably not very fucking happy about what Odin was doing. But Steve also says that per, uh, perhaps whatever took the eye from Odin, they had a really good reason for why they did that. Because while Odin is able to see into the Shadowlands, it makes me wonder if whatever took his eye is able to see into what Odin is doing and witness what he is actually doing. Here's what I think. I think that Odin, with the power of Aegir, is basically making his own Valkyr and doing all of this stuff. And I don't think that uh, that death likes that very much, right? So I think what Sylvanas probably was doing is she had the lantern that she got from Helia, and the purpose was probably to take a year, not to uh, to make infinite Valkyr do anything like that, but to stop Odin from continuously making more Valkyr and shepherding more people into the Halls of Valor, shepherding more souls. They probably wanted to stop that process because they probably wanted those fucking souls to go to the Shadowlands. So with that all being said, the being who most likely holds Odin's eye, I would probably think is actually Helia at this point. And Helia probably learned through what she saw through Odin's eye that that, that was the case, and then they set out to stop it. I think that's probably what the deal was between Sylvanas and, and Helia. I, I don't know what Sylvanas was meant to receive in return, of course. Uh, perhaps it was something to do with Valkyr, or perhaps an ascension to become a very powerful Valkyr herself. I do not know. But anyway, I think that's that's probably what that pertains to. Um, taking another step uh, in kind of a, a similar and interesting direction, let's talk about what Nazoth says for a second, because Nazoth literally predicted and said that this would happen. The veil wanes. His crown will open the way. Yeah, that's 100 million percent talking about Bolvar Fordragon and the opening of the gateway to the Shadowlands. Uh, now, about that, uh, he also says that she will show you the way, probably talking about Sylvanas. So whatever happens with Nazoth at the end of 8.3, which we don't have officially determined yet, uh, it's more than likely something that Nazoth was aware was going to happen. Uh, so I, I'm not so sure what Blizzard's doing with the old gods at this point, but it would seem that Nazoth was kind of completely aware of all of this and the whole having our eyes opened to the truth uh, Nazoth having quotes when you die, saying things like, at last, embrace the truth of Shadow, probably has something to do with what's going on with our journey to the Shadowlands. Now let's talk about, let's talk about the whole Bolvar and the fucking helmet and Arthas and everything. Because this is a big point of contention too. We previously had the understanding that the Nathrezim, at the behest of Kil Jaden, crafted the Helm of Domination, and they crafted Frostmourne, Right? Now, people are calling this a soft retcon because apparently the forge that was used to craft these things is in the Shadowlands. And I would really, really caution against just throwing around the word retcon because what a lot of people do is they call shit a retcon that's not really a retcon. This is what a retcon is, okay? We're told the Dreadlords made Frostmourne and they made the Helm of Domination. The Dreadlords directly crafted it. Retcon would be... Kill Jaden actually crafted it himself, and then the Dreadlords just basically delivered it. Officially changing who made it would be a direct retcon. 
but saying that the Nathrazine crafted it and that it was crafted in the Shadowlands and we, may, we might actually meet its crafter is not a retcon. It's a further revelation of information. They're revealing more to you and it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a, an absolute change. It can just be in addition to the knowledge you already had. Here's the, here's the case. Let me, let me tell you about this. In Legion, when you kill Gul'dan for the first time, you can get this artifact piece, uh, artifact power, that is literally titled the headpiece of the Shadow Council, and it says, uh, with a deep, uh, the top row on Gul'dan's staff, uh, the headpiece of the Shadow Council had a deep connection to the Shadowlands, and it was a very useful tool, a very powerful instrument in the hands of Gul'dan and his Legion Masters. That is to say that the Legion had deep connections to the Shadowlands. Think about this. If the Nathrazim crafted the Helm of Domination, and then Death Knights, which are direct descendants of the Lich King's power, are able to basically walk among the Shadowlands for a brief period of time, it wouldn't blow my mind if one of the most cunning and shadow-aligned enclaves of demons, the Dreadlords, had access to the Shadowlands. That wouldn't shock me at all, especially considering they had Argus, who seemingly is like this shadow titan that is aligned with death. They, they basically wielded the power of death. It would not blow me away whatsoever if the, if the Nathrazim actually did craft Frostmourne in the Helm of Domination, but they crafted it or got help crafting it in the Shadowlands. I just think that it's something that like we should probably just not jump on and start calling a retcon because people get super pissy and up in arms about retcons before actually kind of letting all the information come to light. But a big factor of this, the question, and I've not seen anybody ask about this or say anything about this, is if if it's true, did the Dreadlords know and did the Legion know the entire time that the helmet was actually a key to opening the veil between worlds? Because apparently Sylvanas learned that. She knew she obviously knew, figured that out somewhere because she knew that that was gonna happen. And when Sylvanas does it, she calls this world a prison, which I fucking jizzed when she said that, uh, and that she's going to set us all free. Did the Nathrazim and have the Legion been fully aware of that? And if that's the case, could this potentially have been part of the Legion's over, o overarching plan to have someone, probably specifically someone like Sylvanas, come forth and shatter this veil between the realm of life and the realm of death? And if that also was the case, was there a connection there previously before the Helm of Domination was crafted? See, these are little... Little questions I'm just not sure about, because it seems like the helm was lit literally a key that was used to break open a massive barrier that was crafted there. Who crafted that barrier? In my opinion, probably the Titans, uh, but I can't prove that, so I digress. But how long has that been a factor in the lore? How long has that been a piece of information? Where did Sylvanas learn that? Pro I guess probably from the Jailer, especially if the Helm of Domination's power actually stems from the Jailer himself. Uh, and ultimately, this kind of could potentially feed back into this idea that whether by proxy or by uh, intention, Sylvanas could actually be kind of serving the Burning Legion, which has been a theory of mine for quite a long time. Uh, so anyway, there's there's a lot of shit going on here, and anywhere from the Arbiter and its purpose to the origins of the Shadowlands and what the Jailer's doing, what the end goal for Sylvanas is, what the involvement with Helia actually uh, implies... Uh, this origin of Frostmourne and the Helm of Domination and the, the Dreadlord's involvement in it, uh, this veil and how the crown was basically used to open the way. There's a lot of new information that was basically just fucking thrown at us by Blizzard. Uh, and it's probably going to take a little time to kind of decode and, and look through it and figure some of the shit out. So these are just some of the questions and thoughts that I've been having and things that I've been kind of thinking about and, and seek to, pro and, you know, seek to try to uncover. Um, a couple last points is that I think the veil probably was already beginning to weaken from what Sargeras did uh, with his giant sword. Uh, just, uh, just a thought there. Um, additionally, I do think that the the new ten boss raid Castle Nathria that seemingly has a big dreadlord looking thing on the top of it based on the concept art will probably reveal something to us at least about about dreadlords and perhaps their involvement in the Shadowlands. We actually haven't seen Malgana since the start of Legion, and I'm pretty sure Anatheron was also there at the start of Legion, and we haven't seen him either. But but mostly Malgana and his huge involvement, obviously with Frostmourne and Arthas and the whole Lich King thing in general, uh, could lead us to actually run into Malgana again. Uh, so you know we'll we'll see what happens. But uh, I just I wanted to go through all this today because this is just stuff I've had on my mind since BlizzCon, and I'm curious to know what you guys think about it. So uh, yeah.
this is this is going to be interesting. I'm super excited for Shadowlands, and there's a lot more that I want to talk about moving forward. So if you guys like this video, please do drop a like in the video. It's the best way to let me know that you enjoy my content here on YouTube and the best way of supporting my channel. If you guys are new to my channel, 50% of the people that watch my videos are not subscribed to my channel. So if you're not subscribed, do yourself and do myself a favor and uh, hit that subscribe button and hit the bell icon for notifications so you know when new videos are coming out. If you guys are not aware, I do have a Twitch stream, twitch.tv slash pyromancer. You guys can go and follow me over there. We just hit 19,000 followers. I'm shooting for 20K. So if you guys can help me get up there, that would be awesome. I also do have a Twitter, twitter.com slash pyromancer sarg. You guys can go and follow me. I often tweet about lore related stuff and sometimes just random stuff. So if you guys want to ask me direct questions and interact with me, that's probably one of the better places to do it. Then the last thing is I do have a Patreon, patreon.com slash pyromancer. And there will be a link to that in the description down below as well. So if you guys want to throw me a couple dollars per month to help support me, my channel, my content, and everything that I do here for you guys, I would greatly appreciate that. But of course, you never have to do that. You can always just come back and watch my videos as you please. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Once again, I appreciate you very much. Stay awesome. And until next time, I'll see you guys later. Peace.